I'm Dr. Thad Botham, and this brief logic lecture discusses how to prove a conditional in an argument. Remember, a conditional is a claim or proposition, so it's true or false, and they play central roles in a variety of arguments. But this lecture uh, discusses how to prove them as a conclusion in an argument, and they in turn can serve as premises elsewhere. There are three types of conditionals. There is the material conditional, there is the strict conditional, and then finally the counterfactual conditional. And the difference in type depends upon what counts as a counterexample to each of the conditionals. That's a way to tell. This lecture covers how to prove a material conditional and then also how to prove a strict conditional. And we'll leave the counterfactual conditional to another time because it's too difficult for such a brief lecture like this. Finally, before we get started, I'm going to assume that uh, we know what an extraction is, where I'm using that term extraction to uh, denote an argument that is transparently rigorous in a numbered premise-premise-conclusion format, where each line is cited as underived, or I'll call it basic, and then the inferences are clearly indicated at the end of the lines as well. And then finally, I'll assume a little bit that we understand symbolic logic, that these variables that we use, these capital letters, uh, P and Q, for example, could stand in place of any proposition whatsoever. All right, let's get started. To prove a material conditional, that's what that little sideways horseshoe means, uh, if P, then Q. I'm going to give you the recipe for it and a little diagram. But before we get started, keep in mind what counts as a counterexample to this material conditional, if P then Q. What counts as a counterexample is an assignment where the antecedent P is true, while Q, the consequent, is false in the world in which that material conditional shows up. So here's the recipe to prove one. At any place within your argument, you just assume the antecedent of the conditional you want to prove. So in this case, it's if P then Q. Uh, you just assume P and you flag it as an assumption or a supposition and you would just say for conditional proof. And then that gives your reader a heads up that, hey, uh, you're intending to prove a conditional whose antecedent is that proposition P. Along the way, you may introduce, after that line, any truth you wish as an underived, or I'll call it basic, premise. Now, you need not introduce any other truths as and label them as basic or underived, but you're certainly welcome to. An important feature that's non-negotiable here is you need to draw at least one valid inference, and you can draw as many valid inferences as you wish. But the hope is that eventually you find Q as one of those lines you validly uh, derive from the others. And once you do, you're done. You conclude if P then Q, and the citation at the end of that conditional, when you flag that line, you cite the entire block of inferences, the numbers that were used, sometimes the number of lines, the number of basic premises you introduced, and the number of in inferences you made are lengthy. Sometimes it's not so much at all, but whatever the case may be, you include all of the lines beginning with that assumption and ending with that consequent and all the ones in between. And here's a little diagram to show this. There it is. This is the template, so to speak, for an extraction where you prove the conditional if P then Q. Notice the antecedent is the first line, and you flag it precisely this way. The consequent matches perfectly the last line before you derive. And then along the way, you, can, you have two options within here. You can advance any truth you wish and cite it as underived or basic, and then derive only 
valid inferences. And here you cite all the lines, 1 through M. And here I would prefer, uh, if you're doing it for one of my classes, you don't use Roman numerals. You use numbers such as these. But this gives you the template. So that's how to prove the material conditional. More interestingly, especially when we're doing philosophy, is the strict conditional. The strict conditional basically says the material conditional is true in every possible combination, in every possible world that uh, might have obtained instead of our world, in every uh, complete consistent situation that might have obtained rather than the situation that is reality, the actual world, the material conditional is going to be true. In other words, think of it this way. What would count as a counterexample to the strict conditional would just be one consistent situation where the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. At least one consistent situation where that happens would count as a counterexample. So here's the recipe to prove it. It's going to look very similar to the material conditional with one striking exception. Let me just put it all out and then we'll discuss it. Again, you assume the antecedent of the conditional you want to prove. You're going to draw any valid inferences to get the consequent, conclude, and cite the entire block. The difference between proving a material conditional, which was the last slide, and then proving the strict conditional, which is this one, is whenever you introduce an underived or basic premise, that premise needs to itself be a necessary truth. So strict conditionals themselves are necessary truths. They're true, if true at all, in every possible world that might have obtained rather than ours. Whenever you introduce any underived premise within the argument, and you're certainly welcome to, you get to earn the strict conditional only if whichever underived premise you introduce along the way is itself a necessary truth. Okay, that's the strict conditional. They're extremely important in philosophy. Many times when philosophers argue, they are interested in what must be the case, what's necessarily the case, rather than merely what happens to be the case, in fact. So these strict conditionals play a vital role in arguments that philosophers propose. And when they're trying to prove a principle that they think is necessarily true, it's going to take this form. So be watching for that when you look at arguments when someone's trying to prove a, that a principle is true. You'll see that they'll assume certain conditions. And this might be fairly complicated. It might be a certain setup that includes many different factors. And the principle will be, hey, whenever you're in that situation or whenever that holds, here's what else holds as well in a principled way. No counterexample to that conditional. Let's go through an example with real words, with real claims. So the cat's out of the bag here. Here's the conditional we're attempting to show. And it's if someone believes a con that a contradiction is true, then someone holds a false belief. And we'll assume the antecedent. Notice this premise. We flag it as an assumption. We're pretending it's true. It's like saying, well, let's just suppose for sake of argument and see where it goes. Notice that this claim, one, is precisely the antecedent here in the conditional, is it, and which is exactly as it should be. And the last line before the conditional is the consequent of that conditional. So right here, someone holds a false belief. Does that match word for word? Sure does. So the format is fine so far. And what we're looking for in this empty space, uh, what will permit is only a basic premise that's true and valid inferences. So let's see. Uh, here we'll introduce just a truth 
seems necessarily true. In fact, it is necessarily true. Every contradiction is false. Here's another basic claim. It's also a, it is a conditional itself. If someone believes a contradiction is true and every contradiction is false, then someone holds a false belief. And a nice example for the candidate here that holds the false belief would be this person, although that's not committed, you're not committed to that in this claim. Nonetheless, the claim is true. Let's draw an inference from one and two. And here we are just conjunction introduction. We're introducing a conjunction. This conjunction has two conjuncts, the first conjunct and the second one. Here's the first, which happens to be premise one. Let's see, let's match it. Sure enough, premise one is precisely the first conjunct. We've got the conjunction. And then the next conjunct ought to match premise two. And sure enough, it does. Notice that four taken together here, this conjunction just is the antecedent of three. So we get to use modus ponens on three and four to get the consequent here. Let's see if it says modus ponens three and four. Let's match it up. Is four the antecedent of a conditional? Sure is. And is the consequent of that conditional the line we conclude? It sure is. So we've done it. We've proven this conditional here at six. We assume the antecedent. We introduced basic premises if we wanted to, and we did in this case. We used only valid inferences, and we guaranteed they were valid in this case because we properly used known named valid inference rules. And then we finished our, our extraction, our proof here with the proper citation completes, and we're citing all of the lines that began with the antecedent and ended with the consequent of the conditional proven. Okay, what about the counterfactual conditional? Well, we're not going to get into it. It's just too complicated. But we will review that a counterexample to a counterfactual would be precisely when, in the nearest situation, making the least amount of adjustments or changes to that world in order to get that antecedent true, that there is at least one of those nearby situations where this consequent is false. If there is at least one nearby overall most similar world where that antecedent is true while the consequent is false, then that counterfactual is itself false. But we're not going to get into uh, how to prove one of those. And this concludes our lecture on how to prove a conditional.